We, uh, as has become our want, are working our way chapter a week uh, through uh, through our forthcoming book, which will be out in September, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Last week, uh, or in episode 87, we talked about chapter four. We read a brief, very brief excerpt from chapter four, which was a chapter called Medicine. And this week, we're going to talk um, a bit about food. And really, you know, as the idea of this book in part was that every single chapter could be one or more books unto themselves. And certainly that is true. Um, certainly that is true for this chapter. And um, this is this is a long excerpt this week, but I think... Um, I, th I think it's all it's all relevant and good. This is actually the beginning of the chapter, and it's you know by no means a majority of it, but um, it is a long excerpt. So, chapter five of A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the Twenty First Century: Food. What is the best diet for humans? People have been preoccupied with this question for a long time, especially weird people. Many of us have tried diets that are supposed to be what our ancestors ate. But the lens with which we do this tends to be reductionist and a-evolutionary at best. From diets designed to alter the pH of your body, to those based on your blood type, to those that restrict your intake to one or a few kinds of food, like grapefruit or cabbage soup, weird people are both obsessed with and confused by the question of what to eat. Let's take just two diets that are popular in some circles, two that seem less crazy than many, the raw diet and paleo. Those who advocate for a raw diet suggest that it is the healthiest, most natural way to eat. Cooking, they say, is a modern bastardization of the human diet. This is simply wrong. Not only is cooking ancient in the human lineage, it also allows us to get more calories from food. And while it may be true that cooking can reduce some of the vitamins in the food that has been cooked, the benefits far outweigh this small cost. People on entirely raw food diets are often undernourished, especially if those diets are also vegan. They are generally thin, but that thinness is not inherently healthy. Others argue for the health of the so-called paleo diet, a diet free of grains and most carbohydrates and high in fat. This may well be a healthy diet for some people. <clears throat> but those who came from lineages whose cuisine is rich in carbohydrates, people from the Northern Mediterranean, for instance, may not be best served or most healthy on such a diet. Furthermore, there is growing evidence that early humans were eating a diet rich in carbohydrates from starchy underground vegetables, relatives of which include the African wild potato, as much as 170,000 years ago. This suggests that, while healthy for some, the paleo diet is not particularly reflective of paleo ways of life. These are only two of today's many modern approaches to diet, but they reveal two similarly misguided assumptions about food. First, they imply that there is a fixed and universal answer to the question of what one should eat. Just as we discussed with regard to medicine, the chances of this being true are vanishingly small. Differences in individual development will render some foods healthy for one person, less so for her neighbor. Demographics, such as what sex you are, will affect what food is best for you, and the simple act of aging will change the answer as well. Cultural differences, which are often based on geography, may well affect your optimal diet. And those cultural differences may have moved into the gene layer, reflecting population-level genetic predispositions to particular foods. As with the lactase persistence, of European pastoralists and Saharan Bedouin. Again, remember the Omega Principle, which posits that expensive and long-lasting cultural traits like cuisine should be presumed to be adaptive, and that adaptive elements of culture are not independent of genes. The second misguided assumption that many such diets reveal is that they seem to presume that food is merely for survival. The evolutionary truth is that food is for more than just survival. Food is more than nutrients, vitamins, and calories. Like all animals, indeed all heterotrophs, we eat to acquire the energy and nutrients necessary to be alive, but the human relationship with food, like that with sex, has expanded beyond its original purpose. Humans no longer eat merely to satisfy energetic requirements any more than we have sex just to make babies. An, historic, an ahistorical, reductionist approach to diet attempts to replace food with its component parts. Take this supplement, eat that bar, drink the contents of that can. You'll get X grams of protein, a handful of alphabetically named vitamins, and that rush of energy you've come to expect to get you through your day. As is so often the case, such an approach creates hypernovelty, which then creates new problems of its own, problems that we are too often defenseless against. The mistakes inherent in this approach are many and the hubris abundant. The 20th century saw the dismantling of Chesterton's cuisine. As suggested by Chesterton's fence, we ought to have understood what cuisine was for before we took it apart. In its place, we got easily quantified and commodified pieces and parts that can be added and subtracted in a whim by the producers of processed food. Instead of chasing the newest diet advice with processed food, now with more B12, we should be eating real food. Real food is that in which the base ingredients are recognizable as coming from a living organism. There are just a few exceptions, like salt. 
Some things taste delicious and flavorful to everyone. Rich and succulent and salty and crispy and sweet and smooth are combinations that are beloved across cultures. Our sense of taste evolved in an era when meat and other fatty foods, salt and sugar were all rare. Our sense of flavor is thus evolved and important. This is true, and it is true that our sense of flavor can be and is gamed in a system that can easily create fat, salt, and sugar and add them to any foodstuff it wants, another manifestation of hypernovelty. Fast food tastes good to many people because it successfully games our sense of taste, accessing single notes, fatty, salty, sweet, in a reliable, uniform way that can be triggered any time you order the same thing in any one of hundreds of identical stores. By contrast, a plate of carne asada, rice, and beans, with freshly made tortillas, pico de gallo, guacamole, and pickled vegetables from a local taco stand or from your own kitchen, will always be more nutritious and more delicious, too, for many of us and for anyone who chooses to develop a palate that finds it so. That plate of less processed, more species-diverse food is more nutritious than a plate of fast food, just as it is more nutritious than taking pills that are supposedly a match for all of the nutritional benefits you're getting from your food. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But why is the whole greater than the sum of its parts? Or to put it another way, why is a holistic approach often better than a reductionist one? Two reasons. First, the parts of a given system that we have turned into pills are usually not descriptive of the whole system. Remember the discussion of vanillin, a component of vanilla, and THC, a component of marijuana, from the previous chapter. Second, there is often emergence in the combination of food in its less processed form, such that our bodies can use food more effectively than it can use pills. This is especially true for those foods that have a long culinary history together, such as the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash traditionally eaten by Mesoamerican peoples. When these foods are eaten together, they constitute a complete protein. Such a long culinary history points to the human discovery, usually unconscious, that just as smells good was a good proxy for good for you until recently, so too was tastes good a good proxy for good for you. Reductionism in our approach to food fails us, as our bodies are not static, simple systems, nor do all individuals have the same needs. There is no universally best diet for humans. There can't be. In our varied environments of evolutionary adaptedness, there were a few staples. In the Andes, quinoa and potatoes were generally on the menu. In the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia, wheat and olives were among the foods domesticated early. In Sub-Saharan Africa, sorghum and guinea yams were significant early agricultural successes. There was meat, sometimes in short-lived abundance. There was fruit, seasonally, also in abundance. There was alcohol, intermittently, and botanically created stimulants in some places. In those places, those stimulants were a regular but low-key part of life. Even the ratio of macronutrients is not stable between cultures. Inuit have a high-fat, high-protein diet with almost no carbohydrates, which is unlike almost any diet that evolved closer to the equator. Given such variation, the idea of a universally best human diet seems patently absurd. In the 21st century, there are many foodstuffs available that will trick you into eating them, even when parts of you are sensing that it's a bad idea to do so. Before the advent of cheap, always available, highly processed food, our ancient aesthetic preferences made a very good guide to what to eat. Those ancient aesthetic preferences aren't so reliable now. Hypernovelty has gamed our ancient rubrics about what to eat and what not to, and thus, we must use our consciousness to separate the good from the bad. Reductionism in our approach to food also fails us in that it ignores food's ability to provide connection to other humans, with the family and friends who cooked for or with you or for whom you cooked. A reductionist, nutrient-centric approach to food fails to allow for celebration or for grief, both of which are often accomplished through food. It fails to recognize and remember cultural tradition and to consider flavors that have come together through serendipity and experimentation. Cuisines old and new reflect both their terroir, the land from which they emerged, and their borrowing from other cultures and places. Those three sisters of corn, beans, and squash are still dominant in Mexican cuisine. Limes, garlic, and cheese, all introduced by the Spanish to people in the New World, have been incorporated deliciously as well. Humans do not just need protein and potassium and vitamin C. We generally need those things in the food context in which, in which our ancestors ate them. We also need culture and connection. When we sit down to eat a meal together, especially when we are breaking bread that we have ourselves made, we gain far more than calories. Let us now look to our evolutionary history, how we ate and what we ate as a way to understand how best we might feed ourselves today. And that will be the next section. You know, when I hear you read that section, I can almost see why our critics see us as simpleton grifter zealots. I mean, kind of comes through in that section a little, a little. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that's uh, fantastic. I, I, I wonder, I'm of course very curious to know what other people hear when they uh 
when they hear that description, especially in light of the fact of it uh, not staking out a standard paleo position right. um, and obviously making rational critiques of uh, current dietary fads. Yeah. So I guess um, maybe before we riff on this a little bit and before we get into some of the other literature I want to I want to walk us through today, um, starting in chapter three of this book, and I have, haven't done it until now, we have at the end of each chapter something that we call the corrective lens in which, you know, to the degree that this is in fact a hunter-gatherer's guide to the 21st century, we, we give some some sort of operational advice on uh, you know what you might do that is apropos the topic of the chapter at hand. And so the corrective lens section for the food chapter is pretty long, but I thought I'd just share three of the of the many more than that bullet points from it. And let's um, let's riff on these. Let's see. Um, well, we begin this corrective lens section by saying we might call this section the new kosher. Most ancient dietary laws are now out of date, but that does not mean that we couldn't use some rules around how, what, and when to eat. Avoid GMOs. GMOs are neither inherently dangerous nor inherently safe. They are, however, different from the artificial selection that farmers have been engaging in for thousands of years. When farmers chose, choose plants or animals to breed, promoting some traits and downregulating others, they are playing within the landscape that selection has already been acting on. In contrast, when scientists insert genes or other genetic material into organisms that have no recent history with those genes, they are creating an entirely new playing field. Sometimes they will be lucky, and the result will be useful and kind to humans. Sometimes they will not be lucky. Chimerical life forms that have been created by humans using hypernovel techniques are not inherently safe. Anyone telling you otherwise is either mistaken or lying to you. We also have... Um, Expose children to a diverse range of whole foods, especially ones that connect them to your culinary and ethnic background. Eat the same food that you put in front of them and show obvious enjoyment of it. Keep seasonal produce on your counter and let the children eat any fruit that they find there, encouraging them to develop their own preferences while they also learn how and when to explore a variety of whole foods. And do not forget that food is social lubrication for humans. Eating alone in your car after visiting the drive through is a novel situation, and it's not helping us connect with our food, our bodies and their needs, or one another. I mean, I think that, that's one of probably the thing that people will see coming the least uh, in, this, in this chapter, most of which is about the actual stuff that we should be eating and preparing and, and how to combine it and such, um, and the history of our doing so. But the fact of food not being just about sustenance not just being about calories and nutrients, but actually about you know one one of the ways that we connect with one another and see our way through not just celebration and grief, you know, celebration and mourning, festivities and and funerals, uh, but also just the the daily cementing of bonds, right? The 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 fact that you can come to rely if you are if you are lucky enough to live uh, in a in a loving family or in another situation in which the people with whom you share a living situation come together reliably with food over food that you have either made or or brought in or or go out to to find together, uh, that those moments bring people together uh, in a way that's it's just easier. I think people have their guard down when they're sharing good food, um, and especially when it was prepared by. Uh, one or more of the people who are who are sharing it. Yeah, if you, uh, in fact, had a list in front of you of the people you know and the people with whom you have broken bread, you would find that the broken bread with list is a special list, almost inevitably. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's um, you know, at this point, especially especially since we're still you know close to. We're on the near side of um, having been effectively forced into not interacting with people, not into into basically no travel for so long, that we now know many people. Um, we feel like we know well, but we've never met yep. in person. And uh, the fact is, upon meeting in person, what you tend to do is break bread, right? You, we we yep. tend to do that, and that's not. It's not that we actually need to be eating all the time. We really don't. It's that that is a way to bond. That is an historic way to bond, and um, nothing about the modern environment should have changed that. Right, and in fact, if you if this was anything but the modern environment, breaking bread with somebody would force certain things that it no longer does. Right, you yeah. can break bread with somebody where you've sourced 
food from, you know, I don't know, a good restaurant or something like right. that. And so it still has the same symbolic value, but it's not the same thing as uh, cooking a meal for somebody, you know, having them over and thinking about what, you know, what you might want to eat with them, what, you know, puts you and your your, your family in their best light, some favorite meal or something like that. Yeah. But I wanted to highlight something. You know, there are a couple of major themes in our book. One of them is this hyper novelty issue. Um, one of them is the synergy of the various different levels of analysis. And then I think a third one um, is the recognition that we are stuck in this intermediate state where the ancient ways are not directly applicable. The modern ways are almost universally hazardous. And one has to figure out how to steer a rational course that recovers as much of the uh, ancestral wisdom as is useful, and then rationally approaches the topics on which one can't have a traditional view in some reasonable way. And this is sort of mirrored by another phenomenon, an evolutionary phenomenon itself, which is everything, I think this is logically true, everything, everything we might call an adaptation has some initial cause, some problem that it solved or opportunity that it opened. But many of these things, especially in the human context, nowhere more true than in the human context, many of these things have picked up other values, right? So you uh, you read this about, you know, sex not being just about producing babies. Now, obviously, at the evolution of sex, it was. Origin right? of sex, that's what it is. Right. And it really is that for most creatures. And then we get to a small list of creatures for whom that's not exactly true, right? For whom there appears to be augmentation and elaboration and a, basically a borrowing of that mechanism for other things. But it's really a tiny handful of creatures. It's a kind of social glue. Right. Mm -hmm. And then in human beings, we find something really utterly remarkable, right? Which is that the primary purpose may in fact now be in some sense secondary. It's necessary, but the primary purpose may have to do with, um, you know, bonding, relationship yeah. maintenance, and not with direct, you know, it's not that those two things are inherently different. Obviously, in humans, because the babies are so uh, labor intensive to raise well, a pair bonded a uh, couple or more, a pair bonded couple and the family that they bring to the table uh, are, you know, necessary to the proper raising of the children and therefore the social bonding phenomenon is reproductive in some very uh, indirect way. But and, nonetheless- and more on that in two, three, and four weeks. As, right, as right. those chapters, yeah. But, mm -hmm. but my point is, okay, so here you see it with food, right? Is Actually, but before you before you go on, I want to say that um, to some degree, I think um, the fact that you know you've just posited that perhaps, obviously, the the you know the reason for sex to exist um, as is is about reproduction, and. Um, it's possible that in humans one could understand that to actually have become a secondary a secondary function in many cases and that would almost have to have been true in order for the level of confusion that a lot of society now has over you know what sex is and you know how fundamental it is and whether or not you can actually change what you are so again the sex and gender chapter is two chapters from now and we'll talk about it right. fairly extensively 